So today what we're going to be looking at is how we can now represent electron configuration within an element. Uh, now with, armed with the knowledge of orbitals and the different types of orbital. How do we show all the electrons within an atom? Now previously our electron arrangement was in the periodic table in the data booklet and it was for example hydrogen was one and oxygen was two, six. A sodium was two, a eight, one, etc. But that only deals with um, energy levels, really. So this one was first energy level, this one was second energy level, this one's third. We now need to deal with orbitals. What about orbitals? Well, we're going to look at two different ways of representing electron configuration. We're going to look at spectroscopic spectroscopic notation, which is a variation on this, and then we'll look at um, orbital, I can't spell, orbital box plots or box diagrams to represent them which is, this one's a bit more like a diagram, this one's similar to this, it's like a list of numbers. Now before we do that, we need to know that there are three rules for how we do electron configuration. There are three rules. Now the first rule, probably the most important, is called the Aufbau principle. Now the alpha principle states that you cannot have um, orbitals filling in a random order. Um, orbitals fill from lowest to highest energy. Now this might seem simple, but actually a, the order of orbitals in energy levels is not straightforward. You'd probably think, okay, it's probably 1s, and there's only 1s orbital. So then we'll do second energy level, 2s, 2p. Then, okay, third energy level, it's got a uh, 3, it's got a p orbital. Then we'll move into the 4. Well, the 4 has got an s, and it's got a p, it's got a d, and it's even got an f. So we'll fill all the ones in energy level 1, all the ones in energy level 2, energy level 3, energy level 4, and do it that way. It's not that straightforward. Um, the order, especially when we get to the third and fourth and beyond orbitals, some of these orbitals in the fourth energy level are lower in energy than some of the orbitals in the d energy level. So we'll show you a diagram of how it goes. So, we start off quite straightforward. So we've got, this is n equals 1 here. And we've got 1s. Then we've got n equals 2. We've got 2p and 2s. So 2s, then 2p. 
Okay, third energy level seems fine. We've got 3s, 3p, and then we'd expect 3d, but actually, oh, we've got 4s, and then we've got 3d, then 4p, and then before we get to 4d, we've got 5s, and then when we get 6 and 7, it gets even more complicated again. So this is where the complication begins. And we've got 3d higher in energy than 4s, and 4p then coming next. However, the periodic table is organised in such a way that this starts making sense. So if we show you the periodic table, s block, p block, d block. Well, 1s, then 2s, then 2p, then 3s, 3p, 4s, oh, now we have a d block, and it's the first d block that exists, um, and there isn't a d block for 1s or 2s, because there's not enough quantum numbers for them to do that, but there is for 3, so 4s, 3d, 4p, 5s, 4d, 5p, now 6s, and then this is where f block comes in, you go 6s, 4s, 5d, 6p, and so on. It gets increasingly complicated, but the order in which the elements appear and these blocks appear is the order in which you fill the orbitals. So you fill the 1s first, then 2s, then 2p, then 3s, then 3p, 4s, 3d, 4p, 5s, 4d, 6p. And now when it comes to uh, doing this in an exam, you're only ever asked up to this point. So you're only asked up to Krypton. That's the first uh, 36 elements, I believe. First 36 elements is up until Krypton. Yeah, first 36 that you're expected to know, and that takes you to the end of the 4p. So, no need to get stressed about this. The only bit where it seems to not just go up in increasing order is the fact we go 3s, 3p, 4s, 3d, and then 4p. Okay? Now, that's the rule um, that we call the alpha principle. You need to fill it in increasing order of energy. Now if you look at this diagram again, what you'll notice is that, well the s orbitals, they've all got one on a line, but here we've got three orbitals all together, we've got three all together here, we've got the d orbitals all together, we've got these p orbitals, We've got these d orbitals. They're all different orbitals, but they've got the same energy. Where we've got a system like that, where the orbitals are equal in energy, we call that degenerate. And that means they have the same energy. So all three p orbitals, all five d orbitals, have the same amount of energy, Energy, sorry, so we call them degenerate. And the existence of degenerate orbitals takes us into our second rule for filling orbitals, which is called Hunt's rule. And this is degenerate orbitals they get filled with one electron each before pairing electrons.
So before we um, pair up any electrons, we need to fill each of the p orbitals first. So we put one in the first type of p orbital, then the second type, then the third type, before we start putting the pairing. And that is, again, it's due to the fact that electrons both have negative charges, and so repel one another. So they'd prefer to be in different orbitals to one another. And so as much as that's possible, that's what happens. And when that can no longer happen, and we have to pair electrons, it takes us to our third rule, which is the Pauli exclusion principle. Now the Pauli exclusion principle is that um, if there are two electrons in the same orbital, they must have opposite spins. So remember, if we are uh, talking about quantum numbers, that means one must have a spin quantum number of plus a half, and the other must have minus a half. Now often, when we're talking about spin or representing spin, it's easier to represent an electron that's got a positive spin as an arrow pointing upwards, and one like that, pointing downwards. So you will see this notation using arrows come in later on. But these are three rules for filling orbitals. Alpha principle is we fill orbitals from lowest to highest energy. And you can tell that in the periodic table. 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 4s, 3d, 4p is our order. Hunt's rule says that we fill orbitals individually if they are degenerate before pairing electrons. So that means if we've got three p orbitals, we put one electron in each p orbital before pairing them up. And the third rule, the Pauli exclusion principle, if two electrons are in the same orbital, they must have opposite spins. Uh, essentially, Pauli exclusion principle means no two um, electrons can have the same four quantum numbers. So we're going to use this information to help us write out the electron configuration of different elements. So we're going to start with the notation that doesn't require a lot of those rules. We're going to start with this one. And this only relies on the Aufbau principle. So, only relies on the Aufbau principle. So, spectroscopic notation. The spectroscopic notation Um, spectroscopic notation is a list of numbers and letters. And always do this armed with a periodic table. So always do it armed with a periodic table. So I've got a multicoloured one here. And what you're going to be doing for each element using spectroscopic notation is you find the element and say we'll start with silicon. Silicon is P block element. And what you do is you're going to finish at silicon. You're going to start at hydrogen. And you're going to see what orbitals have been filled and how many electrons will have had to go into each one. So we're working our way to silicon. Well, the 1s orbital, that's been completely filled. How many electrons go in the 1s orbital? 
2. So, silicon starts with 1s orbital and it's got two electrons inside it. Next, okay, lithium beryllium, that's the 2s orbital and it must also have been filled in order for us to get to silicon. So, 2s2. Next one, okay, we've got the 2p orbital and, well, in order to get to silicon, all of those must be filled. How many electrons can go in the 2p orbital? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So, 2p6. Next, okay, we're trying to get silicon, so sodium magnesium, that's the 3s orbital. Well, that 3s orbital, in order for us to go any further, it must be filled. So we've got the 3s orbital. How many electrons can fill it? Two. And then finally we're at silicon, and it's in the 3p orbital. And what we do is just count along how many elements there are until we get to the one we're in. One, two. So there are two in that. So silicon is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 2p12. So we'll try another one. Let's try fluorine. So we find where fluorine is in the periodic table. Right, fluorine's here. So what do we need to do? Well, we needed to fill the first 1s orbital, so 1s. How many electrons can it hold? Two. Got the 2p, uh, 2s orbital. It's been fully filled. 2s, two. And now, okay, well, we're in 2p, and that's where fluorine is. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 2p, 5. Let's try a more complicated one. Let's try arsenic. Okay. Well, arsenic is in the 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 4s, 3d, 4p orbital. So we need to fill all of the orbitals before that. So 1s has been filled, so 1s2. Next, 2s, filled. 2s2. Next, 2p, filled, 2p6. Uh, next, we've got 3s, that's been filled. Then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, okay. 3p has been filled, that's got 6 in it. 4s is next, so remember, s orbitals 1, 2, 3, 4. And it's been filled too. Now we've got the D orbital. Well, the D block must have been filled in order for us to get here. And there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So 3, D, 10. And now we are in the 4P orbitals. And we go 1, 2, 3. Takes us to arsenic. So it is quite a long way of doing it. It can be simplified if we use a process called um, noble gas notation. Now this takes into consideration the fact that, see the noble gases, each time you get to the end of a row, well, lithium is going to have the electron configuration of helium plus this. Magnesium is going to have the electron configuration of neon plus 1, 2. If we wanted to go to something like uh, silver here, well, we could write out all of these orbitals here, or we could say that it was krypton plus just up to here. So rather than write out all the orbitals, we write the noble gas that's come before it 
and then just what's in the period that you're in. So if we try and do that to the ones that we've already done, we do the noble gas notation, well, silicon, silicon's here. And if we go back to the period, so we're only gonna wanna talk about these ones. The noble gas that has been filled is neon. So we put neon in square brackets, and then look at what's been filled after neon. Well, it's the 3s2, 3p2. You can see that's a lot shorter. For fluorine, well, fluorine is helium plus this. So that becomes helium 2s2, 2p5. So that's not really shortened it a lot. So we don't tend to use noble gas notation for elements until we get to about the third period. However, arsenic, well, arsenic was here, and the closest noble gas is argon, and argon finishes with the 2p6 being completed. It's, no, the 3p6. So if we have argon, and then all we need to write is 4s2, 3d10, 4p3, you can see that this is a lot shorter than this. So noble gas notation gets used to simplify spectroscopic notation, but only do this if you are specifically asked for it in an exam. If you are not asked for noble gas notation, do the full thing. Okay, unless you're asked for noble gas notation, do the full thing. The largest element that you can be asked is krypton, which is up until the end of 4p6. Okay, that's spectroscopic notation. We will come back to this because there are two exceptions. But before we deal with those notations, those two exceptions, sorry, we'll look at the other notation. So the other notation is our orbital box um, notation. And orbital box notation. And when you're doing orbital box notation, you will only get asked to fill out four types of orbital. Um, so four sequential types of orbital. It doesn't have to be these four. It could make you start at um, 4s orbital and go on from there. But we're just going to start with this as a notation. And whenever you're doing orbital box notation, you need to take into consideration all three rules. So the alpha principle, filling each one energy. Hunt's rule, which is going to be important here. Hunt's rule, whenever you're filling degenerate orbitals, that means ones of the same energy, you fill them individually first. And the Pauli exclusion principle is that whenever you are pairing electrons, they must have opposite spins and you need to represent that. Now, in a diagram like this, electrons are represented by arrows. Conventionally, Electrons, first electron you put in, you represent with an up arrow. Now some um, textbooks, some diagrams will use an arrow with a full head, some will use it just half a head. And then when you're pairing them, you can do that. It's usually easiest to do the half arrow uh, for reasons that will become clear in um, unit two. So that's what I'm going to use. I'm going to use a half arrow. But sometimes in PowerPoints, because a half arrow is difficult to produce, full arrows might get used. So just know that you can use a full or a half and people will understand what you mean. So let's go for a simple one. Let's go for a boron. Let's go for boron. 
Our boron is here. So we've got the 1s orbital, the 2s orbital, and the 3p orbital. Now remember, when we are filling electrons, we're going to fill them up in order of increasing energy. So we've got one, two, three, four, five electrons to put in. So, well, we could go one, two, three, four, five, but remember we need to fill orbitals in order of increasing energy. So we need to fill this orbital first, then this orbital, then we move into this one. So, got boron. And we're going to use all the rules. So we've got one orbital here, so we fill it with an electron. Second electron, what do we do with that? We could put it in here, or we can put it in here. Alpha principle means we need to put it in here, because we need to fill this one because it's lower in energy. We then need to use the Pauli exclusion principle, which states that if we've got two electrons in the same orbital, they must have opposite spins. So our second electron must be like that. Then, the next one, 2s orbital, it's filled. So again, we draw our arrows in. And then, we've just got one more electron for boron, and we just put it in here. Now let's look at carbon, which is the next atom along. So that has five electrons. This one has six electrons. Okay, well, let's see. We're going to start exactly the same, aren't we? But now, we've done that. What can we do next? Well, we can. We could pair it up, or we could move on to the next one. Now, Hunt's rule, which was the second rule, says that if we have degenerate orbitals, we need to fill them individually or singly first before pairing them. So we're not going to put an electron in here. We have to do that. So we have to alpha principle, fill this one, fill this one, then fill these ones. Hunt's rule says that we need to fill them individually first. And again, Pauli exclusion principle, again, wants to minimise the amount of pairing, but if it does happen, they need to be oppositely paired. Now, I've only drawn enough orbitals, so we'll just finish. Uh, this one will do oxygen. Now, oxygen has eight electrons, so it's going to be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Then our filling rules. Uh, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then eight. So we're doing one, two, three before pairing them up again. Now this notation is a lot easier. Sometimes you'll see the diagram rather than be um, horizontal like this. You might see it drawn 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s. You might see them drawn vertically. It's more common to see it horizontally. Uh, but if it is drawn vertically, lowest energy at the bottom, highest energy at the top. If it's uh, drawn horizontally, lowest energy to the left, highest energy to the right, always start at the left. Now, I said that there were exceptions to the rule. And so we'll look back at spectroscopic notation. There are two exceptions to the rule. And they're quite important exceptions. Now those exceptions are the elements chromium and the elements copper. And chromium and copper are both in the D block. We've got chromium here, copper here. 
And if we were applying the rules, the normal rules for chromium and copper, I'm going to draw, do the full notation. So chromium, we would expect it to be 1s2, uh, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. And then we're getting into the point where what we would expect is 4s, s, that's a 3, 4s2, 3d4 is what we would expect. But actually, that's what we expect. But actual, is 4s1, 3d5. Now for copper, we'd have the same, 1s2, 2s2, 3p, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. And then what we would expect is 4s2, 3d9. But in actuality, what we get is 4s1, 3d10. Now there is a reason for this. And you can see what's happened is that an electron, rather than going to the s orbital, has been put in the d orbital in both cases. And that's because a fully or half filled d orbital is more stable than a fully filled s orbital. So if you can uh, half fill a d orbital or fully fill a d orbital, you will do that rather than do the s orbital. So you'll borrow an electron. There's two rules to that. Now, if we're looking at orbital notation, box orbital notation for that, if we have got chromium and copper, what we would expect for chromium is to go 1, 2, 3, 4. That's what we'd expect. But what happens instead is that 4s 3d and with copper what we would expect is 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 but what happens instead we do that and that's simply because that's more stable and we'll notice that um, the 4s and the 3d orbitals have a complicated relationship and this is really really true whenever transition metals become ions so transition metals they can all form two plus ions. Every single one of them can form a two plus ions, a two plus ion. A lot of them can form other types of ions, but all of them can form two plus ions. This is due to loss of the 4s electrons. And so 
whenever transition metals form ions, they form ions by losing their 4s electrons before any of their d electrons. So if we look at titanium, titanium, and this time I'm going to use noble gas notation, titanium is argon, 4s2, 3d2. Titanium 2 plus is argon 4s0, 3d2. Let's do manganese this time. Manganese is argon 4s2, 3d5. Manganese 2 plus is argon 4s, I don't know why I keep doing a 3, uh, 4s 0, 3d5. Um, magnesium can also form a 3 plus, so magnesium 3 plus would be argon 4s 0, 3d4. So the 4s electrons always lost first whenever they're doing that. So if you've got a plot like this and you're doing the electrons, you remove these ones first and then you have that. Okay? That becomes difficult. So if that was chromium, chromium 2 plus would have this one lost and that one lost. Copper 2 plus, lose that one and that one. So it'll always have the 4s and then it'll take from here. Okay. So those are the different notations and those are the two exceptions. Now there's one final bit of evidence which actually we need to look at and that is first ionisation energy. Now in higher you learnt a rule that as you go across a period first ionisation energy um, first ionization energy increases. But if you look at the periodic to, if you look at the data booklet, sorry, at the ionization energies, first ionization energies, so if we've got it here, first ionization energies, so we've got lithium, beryllium, 400, 900, then we get a drop from 900 to 800. Then it starts to increase again until we go from nitrogen to oxygen. And we get another drop from 1,400 to 1,300. And then let's go the next row down. Well, sodium, magnesium, about 500, 740. It then drops again at aluminium. And then it goes up again to phosphorus. And then there's a small drop at sulfur. And then it continues to go up again. So this is seen consistently. So if we go group 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 of the periodic table. So we're ignoring things. What we see in terms of ionisation energy is a pattern that looks a bit like this. It goes up, then it drops, then it goes up again, then it drops, and then it goes up again. Now this is an S orbital. These are, so all of this is a p orbital. 
Now this is half filled, and then that's when we're having to pair electrons. So any time we're going across here, the reason we get a drop here is because it's easy to remove first electron from p orbital. In other words, a fully filled s orbital is more stable than the first electron going into a p orbital. The reason we have a drop here is because you're going from this situation. So in group five, you've got your p orbitals like this. In group six, so that's five. In six, you've got this. This electron is easy to remove. Because electrons repel. So the reason why you get a drop between groups two and three is because you're starting to fill a p orbital and it's not very stable. The reason you get a drop between five and six is because you're getting rid of your first paired electron in a p orbital. And you see this all the time. Consistently between group two and group three you see a drop in ionisation energy, and between groups 5 and 6, sometimes called group uh, 15 and 16, you also see a dip, or horizontal, no change. And that's to do with the stability. And you could be asked to explain that based on the electron configuration. So it could be from uh, an orbital box diagram, or um, through spectroscopic notation, Describe why that's the case. And this one, because you started to fill a p orbital. This one, because you have had to pair an electron in a p orbital for the first time. And that electron that's been paired is easy to remove. Now this has been one of the longest videos uh, so far. There's a lot to unpack. A lot of rules for electron configuration. A couple of exceptions to the rule, but I hope that that's been clear and I will see you next time.